Welcome to Promises to Keep. In this recording, we're going to read pages 26 through 29. Please have your book open and follow along, starting on page 26. We'll read the text first, and then we'll go back and we'll look at the photographs and read the, do uh, the captions. With the country delicately balanced toward change and baseball under pressure to set the pace, someone within the executive ranks of baseball had to commit to breaking the color barrier. A couple of baseball owners had tried to be pioneers before 1945, but were unsuccessful. Then, with exquisite timing, Branch Rickey, president and general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, stepped forward. He was just the man for the job. Wesley Branch Rickey was born December 20, 1881, in Stocksdale, Ohio. He played baseball as a young boy in the Ohio countryside. Rickey attended Ohio Wesleyan University. Summers, he helped support himself by playing semi-pro baseball. Even as a young man, Branch Rickey had strong values and firm beliefs. For example, while a student at Ohio Wesleyan, he began playing Major League Baseball for the Cincinnati Reds, 1905. He refused to play games on Sundays because it was against his religious principles. Ricky was released from the team for taking this stand. From that point on, he had a clause written into all of his baseball contracts stating, that he did not have to report to the ballpark on Sundays. After Ricky graduated from Ohio Wesleyan, he went to law school, worked as an, as an athletic director and baseball coach, and played big league ball for the St. Louis Browns, 1906, and the New York Highlanders, 1907. In his spare time, he lectured against legalizing alcohol. Ricky went on to manage the St. Louis Browns and Cardinals, the Brooklyn Dodgers, and the Pittsburgh Pirates. In 1942, Branch Ricky was named president of the Brooklyn Dodgers. A year later, he went to the board members of the Dodger Club and told them that he wanted to recruit players from Negro League teams. The board wasn't surprised. Ricky was well known for bold moves. During World War II, he replaced seasoned ball players who were off fighting in Europe with boys as young as 15. In the 1930s, Ricky built baseball's farm system, which today is called the minor leagues. When Ricky first proposed integrated baseball, the commissioner of baseball at the time, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, was firmly against it. Landis died on November 24, 1944, and the new commissioner, A.B. Happy Chandler, took the opposite position and said, I don't believe in barring Negroes from baseball just because they are Negroes. Branch Rickey agreed. There were two basic reasons why Branch Rickey wanted to break baseball's color line. First, he deeply believed in equality and thought it was unfair to keep black ball players out of the major leagues. Second, he wanted to build the strongest team that would win games and excite the fans. Ricky knew that the talent pool in the Negro Leagues was too tempting for a smart businessman to ignore. Branch Ricky took a year preparing to bring black ball players into the major leagues. He knew that success depended on finding the man who'd be right on and off the field. Ricky studied the field using scouts to explore the pool of players. There were many Negro League players who were well-known and proven professional baseball players. Players such as Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson certainly headed the list provided by Mr. Ricky's scouts. Branch Rickey studied the reports, listened to his scouts, and talked with black sports writers. 
They universally agreed my father not only had the ability to play on a major league level, but was the right man to pioneer the integration of major league baseball. Still, Ricky's decision was not an easy one. So what was it that really swayed him? What convinced him to take the risk with Jackie Robinson? Boys and girls, if you take a look on page 26, you're going to see there's a photograph and the caption says, Branch Rickey fought for what he believed in. On page 27, it looks like a magazine page that also has a photograph of Branch Rickey with a photograph of Jackie Robinson. The article title is, A Branch Grows in Brooklyn. It says, Look Magazine, one of the leading magazines of its time, profiled Branch Rickey. And when you profile someone, you examine that person and study the person to see all the different details and unique facts about that person. Let's get back to Sharon Robinson's question here at the bottom of page 27. She says, what convinced him, Branch Rickey, to take the risk with Jackie Robinson? So why did Branch Rickey choose Sharon's father? At the top of page 28, we have a heading. Why my father? I don't know about you, boys and girls, but I pretty much figure she's going to tell us. Let's find out. It says, on August 28, 1945, my father, who was playing baseball for the Negro League's Kansas City Monarchs, met Branch Rickey to discuss playing for the Dodgers. There are many reports but few eyewitnesses to this historic meeting, which took place at Branch Rickey's office in Brooklyn, New York. Rickey knew all about my father's extraordinary athletic ability and that he'd successfully played on integrated teams in college. What he didn't know much about was what kind of person my dad was. So, before Ricky set up a face-to-face -face meeting, he called out to California to speak with people who knew my dad. He learned that dad had been raised in a religious home by a mother whose values matched Ricky's own. He heard that dad was a serious guy who didn't drink. He also heard that dad was an aggressive competitor with a fiery temper. Ricky must have liked Dad's strong personality, but I'm sure he wondered how pressure would affect his playing. Nonetheless, he sent his scout, Clyde Soupforth, out with instructions to bring Jackie Robinson to Brooklyn. According to newspapers, magazines, books, and movies, Branch Ricky and my dad eyed each other cautiously during the warm-up discussion. Ricky launched into a series of questions that were less about baseball and more about character. Did he have a girl? The Dodgers president wanted to know. Dad looked Ricky straight in the eye and explained that he was engaged and hoped to marry when he had a job. Satisfied that my father would have a supportive partner, Ricky went on to talk about the need for my dad to hold back his anger control his impulse to strike back, and play extraordinary ball in spite of fear. My father listened carefully. He felt excited, scared, and thrilled by the opportunity to play in the big leagues. Ricky jumped into a monologue where he quickly shifted roles from that of a racist fan to a spiteful teammate. He taunted my dad with angry, mean insults. My father leaned forward, hands fisted, feet planted firmly on the floor. I can only imagine the thoughts that must have run through his mind. 
this was more than just a chance to play in the majors. It was a chance to avenge the racism of his boyhood to help right injustice. Ricky was offering my father a terrific opportunity and tremendous responsibility. Dad was prepared athletically. He had the support of a loving woman and a steadfast mother. He'd matured over the years. He had his faith. But would he hold back his anger for the sake of the mission? The role playing ceased. My father eased back in his chair, unclenched his hands, and met Branch Ricky's steely gaze with confidence and determination. Ricky asked if he could stand the pressure. Would he control his temper against verbal and even physical attacks? Dad didn't respond immediately. The same question was on his mind. He wasn't used to backing down when attacked. Ricky made it clear to my father that the first three years would be critical. For the sake of racial equality, he'd have to adopt a nonviolent approach to change. My father agreed. Branch Ricky knew he'd chosen the right man. He knew that Dad had both the self-control and the courage to succeed. He and my father shook hands on a verbal agreement. The noble experiment began. Let's take a look at the text features on page 29. On the right-hand side, it looks like we have another magazine article. It says, Baseball's First Negro. The Dodgers signed Jackie Robinson. First breach in game's racial barrier. And then the caption that goes with this says, On October 23, 1945, two months after meeting Branch Rickey, my father flew to Montreal to sign his contract with the Montreal Royals, the Dodgers' farm team, for a bonus of $3,500 and a salary of $600 a month. At a news conference, the Montreal Royals announced to the world that baseball's invisible color line had been broken. And there's another photograph here with Jackie Robinson and Branch Rickey, and let's see what the caption says. The three-hour meeting between my dad, left, and Branch Rickey, right, is legendary. But boys and girls, the moment we've been waiting for for several pages now is about to happen. Thank you for listening. I look forward to seeing you in class and talking about Branch Rickey's decision and why he chose Jackie Robinson. Bye-bye.